I know people have been asking me, why are we wearing blue and white? Why is it, why the white? Why the blue? Like, what is that? I'm going to get to that. And some of you may have been wondering about the beginning with the video clip. So here's, here's what I want you to think about with the video clip. It has to do with Morpheus's speech, where he is telling the people they've been in a long fight with the enemy. And you and I have been in a long fight with the enemy. And that will continue until either we pass on and go to our reward in heaven as a Christ follower or the return of Christ, okay? Whichever happens first, because we know that Jesus defeated the enemy, all right? That he has been defeated. And so the enemy now, his thing is to just take down as many people as he can. As he, basically, he's fighting for his life but he because he knows he already lost. He already knows that. He already knows he's, he's been defeated. So what I loved about that clip was the reminder that even though we are pressed on all sides by so many different things, we are still here. And then we started singing about our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Because we can stand on that and the reminder that we are still here, which is the title of my message, is that we are still here. And I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. One, for the fabulous weather that we are finally, uh, it looks like it's going to be consistently here, so we appreciate uh, all the seasons. But we, especially here in Michigan, love when the temperatures are warmer. Uh, personally, I love the 70s. Um, Father, so we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the flowers that are coming up in the spring and all the things that remind us that you have created so much beauty. Father, I ask that this morning your Holy Spirit would do what he does. That he can take the words you've given me And speak to each person on an individual and intentional level. I ask that the words I speak be what you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, originally, this is how, I feel like this is how every time I preach starts. Originally, I was going to be fill in the blank. Um... I've been reading through the scriptures. How many of you have read through the Bible before? Like, maybe more than one time? Excellent. I, what inspired me to be reading the Word is one of my favorite podcasters, Tim Ross. Um, His podcast is called The Basement. And I loved the way that he could, someone could say something and scripture would come to mind. And then he would look it up and find the thing. And I thought, the only way that I'm going to be able to be in that, be able to do that is I'm going to have to just be in the Word and reading, 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 and so that God can do whatever He's going to do with His Word in my life. So, and it's always amazing how things I've read before, different things pop up that I recognize in different seasons, okay? So that's the plug to encourage you to be in the book if you are not a regular reader. Uh, you can also use audio because sometimes my eyes are tired, so I'll, let, I'll just press the play button and listen. Uh, so there's that. So one of the things that I noticed in Scripture is celebrations. Yes. Yes. God was about celebrating, yes. okay? So, and I noticed that in the U.S., we like to celebrate anything and everything, okay? Birthdays, potty training. Preschool graduation, moving up to middle school, moving up to high school, high school graduation, college graduation, first job, driver's license, new car, first paycheck, anniversaries, engagements, weddings, funerals, and almost every time, food is involved. 
Okay? <laughs> right, exactly. Thank you, thank you, God. For some of us, that, that's the enticement is, oh, there's going to be food? Okay, because otherwise I'm, I'm not that interested. Okay? All right. So um, I wanted to see what does Scripture have to say about celebrating? And what does that look like, especially for the people of Israel? Because what God was doing there was a little bit of a foreshadowing and a blueprint of Christ's bride, the church. Okay? So, um, Scripture talks about biblical celebrations. Sometimes they're one day. Sometimes they were seven days. Uh, the longest one I could find was King Xerxes during the time, time of Esther, 180 days. That is six months. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I know enough people that I like enough that for six solid months, it is party, party, party every day and night. And if you are that person, um, good on you. Okay? Good on you. So King Xerxes did 180 days for all of his nobles and his high officials and all of that. And then after that was over, did a week long for the common folk. But it was like in the palace garden, courtyard, and all this stuff. So it was still very fancy. So if you look in scripture, it talks about like the white linens and all the, like, listen. Like if you've ever wondered what kind of resources our God has, just, just read about Solomon in the temple. Like what that thing was about. That thing, our God is not cheap. Okay? So if you, you know... It doesn't mean he's going to give us all the stuff, but he's going to make sure we have what we need, and when he does it, he does it right, okay? All right, so one of the places where God specifically talks about celebrations is in Leviticus. So when the people came out of Egypt, um, and they were waiting to get to the promised land, that's when God was telling Moses, all right, here are the things that I need my people to know about what my expectations are uh, once they get into the promised land. This is how I want them to assemble, celebrate, and commemorate, and think about and reflect on my holiness and what I have done to get them to where they are. So if you have your Bibles, it will be on the screen, but if you have your Bible, uh, you can open it to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to start at verse 1, okay? So it says, The Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as official days for holy assembly. We have ours, which we're doing right now. So on Sundays, after Jesus rose from the dead, Sunday became that for Christ followers moving forward as our holy assembly. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of complete rest, an official day for holy assembly. It is the Lord's Sabbath day, and it must be observed wherever you live. In addition to the Sabbath, these are the Lord's appointed festivals, the official days for holy assembly that are to be celebrated at their proper times each year. So in addition to the Sabbath... God commanded them to adhere to other days of holy assembly, okay? So, I have, I looked up to see, like, what's the list of, of things that um, God asked for the Israelites to celebrate. So, some of these were spring, and some of these are fall. So, in Scripture, it'll talk about autumn when it's talking about harvest, but their times of year are different than our times of year. So I had to look up to see, like, based on the Hebrew calendar and things like that, well, how does that coincide with our calendar that we use? So in the spring, this time of year, um, I read in one place that today would actually be Passover. So, and then tomorrow would start the Festival of Unleavened Bread, 
and it was a week-long piece. And then they would have first harvest and then festival of harvest, which was seven weeks after first harvest. Okay, so first harvest represented the first day of harvesting, and they're starting to gather all of their grains and things. And they, on all of these, there were offerings that were brought to, to the Lord to honor him. And typically, it was the, if they were week long, the first and the last day were days where God said, I don't want you to do anything. It's a rest day. And other than coming to worship and assemble together as a people, that's all you're doing on those, on those bookends. Then in the fall would be Festival of Trumpets, which was a one day. Day of Atonement, which was nine days after the Festival of Trumpets for one day. And then they had the Festival of Shelters, which was five days after the Day of Atonement, and that was a week-long festival. So some of these are like pretty close together where they, it was like basically a season of celebration, a season of um, honoring God with all the things that he had done and remembering who he is. So some of you were asking me about why the white and the denim and all of that. Well, I kept, as I was preparing for this message, I kept seeing everyone wearing white. And I couldn't figure out, like, what was that about? And I almost didn't even say anything to Pastor Chase about saying, hey, can we ask folks to do that? Because I thought, maybe I'm being too extra, and this is over the top and not really necessary. But I could not shake the feeling. And so I asked him, I said, can we just ask folks to wear white? So if you didn't see the memo, don't worry about it. That's totally fine. Maybe you have white on that we just can't see. Um, So what kept coming to me, I was starting to second guess last night. Um, Thank you. I was starting to second guess last night. Maybe this was a dumb idea. But then he said to me, it's atonement. And with atonement comes cleansing. Everything is white. There's no stain. So in Leviticus chapter 23, further down, God talks about the Day of Atonement. And of course, I have no tissues up here. I don't know what the heck. (laughs) Thank you. Take another one. That's probably a good idea. All right, so um, chapter 23, starting at verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Be careful to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the tenth day that same month, nine days after the Festival of Trumpets. You must observe it as an official day for Holy Assembly, a day to deny yourselves and present special gifts to the Lord. Do no work during the entire day, during the entire day because it is the Day of Atonement when offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with the Lord your God. Uh, If you go back to Leviticus chapter 16, it goes into great detail about the Day of Atonement and what was supposed to happen. So it was an annual sacrifice made on behalf of the Israelites that basically cleansed them of their sin for another year. So a bull and two goats are required. So the bull was used by the priest for him to offer the sacrifice for himself and his family so that he could be sinless before offering the sacrifice on behalf of the people. So the two goats, one was offered as a sacrifice, 
But the second one was called the scapegoat. And that one, the priest would put both hands on the head of the goat, and basically it was symbolizing all the sin of the people, all the rebellion going on the goat, and then there would be somebody who was specifically selected to take that goat way out into the wilderness, away from the camp of the Israelites, taking that sin with it making everyone clean again for another year. The scapegoat, while the other one was being sacrificed, the scapegoat would stand in the presence of God. We just celebrated Easter a couple weeks ago. And I didn't realize this until I was preparing for this message. Jesus was both the sacrifice and the scapegoat. He was willing to endure separation from God for the sins of the people living then current sin past sin future sin same for us past present future he took all of that on his head and stood in the presence of God as the scapegoat waiting to be sacrificed So as he stood silent in every one of those courts, he was standing before a father. So when he says, Father, there's another way, like if there was a way for me to only be the scapegoat and not the sacrifice and the scapegoat, but I don't think he wanted to do the scapegoat either because that meant being away from the father. But he was willing to do that for you and me. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Now, the goat never came back. But Jesus was restored to the Father's right hand. And in that restoration also brought our restoration. So we memorialize that when we take communion, which we did last week. That's how we memorialize the sacrifice of Jesus. But there are other ways that Scripture shows us that God's people would memorialize things. Noah built an altar when they were able to leave the ark. Jacob named the place where he wrestled with God Peniel, meaning face of God, because he was able to see the face of God and still live. Moses built an altar after the Israelites defeated the Amalekites and named it Yahweh Nisi, meaning the Lord is my banner. Israel sang a song of deliverance after the Lord brought them across the Red Sea and defeated their enemies, the Egyptians. So memorials come in different ways. It could be a name change. It could be naming a place. It could be an altar. And memorials allowed the Israelites to pass along from generation to generation what the Lord had done. And here in this family, we know we've been through a lot of things. We've had health crises. We've had staff changes. We've had family members that have gone on because God has called them to somewhere else. Some of us have maybe had challenges with housing, jobs, finances, things with our children. 
So the question I have for you is, what have you been memorializing? Are you memorializing God's protection or the time he didn't come through in the way you thought he should? Are you memorializing God's provision or not being able to do all the things and have all the things? Are you memorializing the healing that he did, but it wasn't 100% so... I'm memorializing the part that he didn't fix. Are you memorializing that God brought you this far or that God only brought you this far? Because of God, we are still here. Despite the health diagnoses. Because of God, we are still here despite the job loss. Because of God, we are still here despite housing challenges. Because of God, we are still here despite the family challenges. Because of God, we are still here despite friendship losses. Because of God, we are still here despite the enemy coming against us. Because of God, we are still here, and the Lord needs us to shine our light for the community where he has us planted. Because of God, we are still here. We've been pressed down, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We are still here. His promises are sure and true. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't matter what it feels like. We're still here. He's still on the throne. And he is coming again. So today we have an opportunity. I want you to think of it as our own day of atonement. Maybe there have been some things that you've been wrongly memorializing today. Um, Each of you should have received a small stone when you came in. If you don't have one, raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get one. In scripture, the Israelites would would usually take stones to create an altar, a place of remembrance. So I wanted all of us to have something to symbolize a place of remembrance. I don't know what it is for you that you need to remember right now that God has brought you through. I don't know what it is right now that this is going to symbolize your change of thinking about what you've been memorializing. But this is something that you can use as a reminder for yourself and potentially have it somewhere where people ask you about it. Why do you have this stone? And you talk about what it represents for you. So this morning, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on maybe we've been memorializing what God's not doing and ask forgiveness and for the Holy Spirit to shift our heart and our thinking. And then also, maybe you need an opportunity to just Create an altar in thanksgiving and remembrance. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that your hearts, that your heart is always in tune with us. 
that you know what we need even before we ask. Father, we come this morning with open hands. grateful for the atonement through Jesus Christ. We thank you that he was willing to be the sacrifice and the scapegoat. We thank you that his love for us was greater than his desire not to go to the cross. We thank you that our sins are forgiven, that we are made pure because of the blood of Christ. We thank you that because of you, Father, we are still here. Despite the challenges, despite the things that the enemy may throw our way, we're still here. And we thank you for the way you provide for us. Even when it may not be readily apparent. We thank you for your generosity. We thank you for the care that you have for us. We thank you that Your love is so great. We don't even fully understand it. Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that even when we don't do it right, you still, your love for us doesn't ever change. That even if we turn away intentionally, you are always working to bring us back to you. And in our humanness, we always are trying to figure out, well, how much do I have to do before I can just cut them off? So we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this small reminder with this stone of all you've brought us through. The reminder that no matter what comes next, you've always been there. You've always come through. and that we don't need to be afraid and that we can trust you. Because if you've done it once, if you've come through once, you're gonna come through again. Even if it doesn't feel like it, even if it doesn't look like it, you keep your word. Father, I just pray for our church family that with the things that we've experienced together, that it would unify us as we remind one another that God has brought us this far. He's going to keep taking us the next step. In Jesus' name, amen.